Tonight is our third in the series for the Friends of Candelaria Nature Preserve Speaker Series, and I'm Katie Stone. And I help Jeannie Allen, who leads our organization, run these monthly meetings so that we can learn more about our beloved Candelaria Nature Preserve. Tonight, we're going to meet the woman who is really masterminding and putting together all the pieces on the ground every day, the work that's happening at the preserve. Cameron Weber is the Habitat Conservation Director with Rio Grande Return. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Cameron. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and sharing with us what you're working on. Let me get this gone and put you here. Hi, Katie. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for showing up for our evening chat. And um, I want to welcome anybody who hasn't um, attended one of these meetings before. Um, Jeannie just added to the chat how you can get signed up to join the Friends of Candelaria Nature Preserve. And um, as she points out there, it's free, um, although donations are certainly welcome. And our friends group is super important to what's happening at Candelaria. Um, tonight, I'm going to give you a just sort of a recap of how the last three seasons have gone and a more detailed look at what you can expect for this coming season in 2024. Um, so as Katie said, my name is Cameron Weber. I'm the Habitat Conservation Director for Rio Grande Return. Rio Grande Return is um, a small nonprofit that is dedicated to the restoration and care of our riparian and wetland and um, habitats around New Mexico, but we're focused mainly on the major Rio Grande watershed in New Mexico. Um, the habitat conservation program within Rio Grande Return um, really evolved out of projects like Candelaria. Um, and so we created the Habitat Conservation Program in 2021, just when we were getting started um, as the main boots on the ground at Candelaria. And, um, you know, all of the work that we do within the Habitat Conservation Program is focused on the kind of care that involves a lot of working hands and getting people more engaged in taking care of places, primarily places that are historically agricultural lands that are converting or transitioning to um, wildlife habitats for their main purpose. I think that's enough about me, Katie. Okay, well, I'm really excited to share this video because I don't know how many of you have seen it, but even if you've already seen this video, it's so worth watching again. So do you want to introduce this and how this came about and um, or would you like us just to watch it and talk about it after? I'd love to introduce it. Um, so this video was um, created because uh, we work together, CEO Dodd and and Rio Grande Return worked together to put in an application to the Healthy Soils uh, program, which is funded by the New Mexico Department of Agriculture. And so the New Me a whole you know year after we had really known that we were doing this project, the NMDA sent out a team of really wonderful documentarians um, led by ESHA to create short videos that would help communicate the value of these healthy soils grants. And thankfully they chose our project as one of five for ESHA to create a video about. So ESHA initially created a really short, like I think a minute and a half video that circulated around and she just recently came back to us with um, this more expanded version. And it's beautiful. She spent a number of days and long days at the, at the preserve doing interviews with a number of us and she captured some really sweet moments. So um, yeah, I, I can share more about what Esha's opportunities to engage with Esha's work um, at the end of the talk. This area has been long used for agriculture up to about 1,700 years ago. Before that, it was a pretty vast mosaic of different habitats. 
as it became developed and as it became peopled, a lot of those areas, especially the wetlands, were either drained or plowed in. How do we take these formerly agricultural lands and restore them? This project is different than most what people think of as restoration. We're not restoring to a past condition. We're trying to create a diversity of habitats that are missing from this area, from this corridor. Grasslands and salt shrublands were the first places to be converted to housing. The floodplain was the first area to be converted to agriculture. These are the habitats that have been most eliminated and are most missing for the wildlife that are still here, trying to find a way around these missing habitats. The main objective on this preserve is really for people to learn about nature, to learn about the ecosystem, to learn about the natural history and the impacts and ability to steward this area as well. So a lot of the future events that are planned are really to drive both youth and also just public involvement in the site to learn about nature, to learn about the ecosystem, to learn about the natural history and the impacts and ability to steward this area as well. This preserve is part of a network of preserves and conservation areas that extend up and down the middle Rio Grande Valley. So this is an interconnected approach. When you're looking at trying to convert 100 acres into wildlife habitat, the main thing that you need are really great native shrubs because native shrubs are so important for creating vertical habitat structure, things for birds to land on. So one of the first things that we did here under a Healthy Soils grant was to request funds to get seedlings that we could then step up into larger containers and grow out in our little nursery. And so we were able to pot up about 2,200 plants into one gallon pots and grow them out for a year and then got them in the ground. They're doing very well and caring for the nursery is a great way for us to connect with keeping that future vision in mind, knowing that all of this needs to find a home out there. People always ask, restoration to what? And I think a really important question is restoration for who? Oh, sorry. Who? I know that a lot of the ecological goals are driven by trying to provide the best quality habitat that's going to endure through future climate scenarios. But we're also doing this for the people who are going to live here in the future, who will want to have a large contiguous place that still has abundant wildlife. So I think we're doing this for the future generations. This project for me really informs on that conservation approach and starts to actively transform agricultural fields, fields that have been heavily degraded into native habitat. And I think that's a really remarkable thing that is not only happening here, but is happening worldwide. So we're part of a larger whole and this restoration project is interconnected to all of those pieces. So for me, that's an amazing thing to be part of and to also pioneer as we're trying some new approaches to get some of these formerly abundant habitats back into the middle Rio Grande Valley. So sweet, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. And thank you so much for explaining it so concisely in this way, what we're seeing. Tonight, we're really excited to hear about what you're doing. Are you ready to take it over and give us your talk? Sure. Thanks. All right. I want some of the Zoom to go away. I'm gonna do that really quick. Okay. So, I can't believe it, but we're heading into our fourth year of this. And 
each year does go by more quickly. Um, but um, tonight I'm going to give you a short talk and then I hope we have a conversation about um, how things are going and what is happening at, at Candelaria. Um, I think I'm going to minimize the amount of framing exactly what Candelaria is. And if anybody has those questions, I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards. So um, this year, we're heading into year four, and we've accumulated a lot of really great partnerships um, through these years and a lot of good habits. And, um, and we're forming some new habits. So I'll just say that one of our you know, good habits that we've formed is that we now have um, even twice a, twice a week, we have Rio Grande Return is hosting on Monday and Friday mornings from eight to noon. Um, we have basically open door policy for, for anyone who wants to come by and, and help out with whatever it is that we're doing on those mornings. So Mondays and Fridays, unless they're a holiday. Um, that is coordinated to happen at the same time as the Friends of Candelaria holds their morning uh, two hours on currently on Fridays from still 10 to noon. As the days get warmer, that time will start shifting to a little bit earlier. Like pretty soon, we'll probably move it to eight to 10. Um, and maybe I shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, I don't know if you can see the people I'm admitting to the, into the meeting. So, so we have these weekly routines of folks showing up to help out many of you. Um, some of our other ongoing, um, engagements are that every month, Cottonwood Gulch, during the school year, Cottonwood Gulch Expeditions brings one of their high school programs out. So it's the same group of high school students who come out every month. So that deepens their understanding of what's happening at Candelaria and gives them a deeper tie to that place as they grow up and leave high school and become members of the community. Um, we've really been enjoying the a number of different student groups from UNM. Um, most recently, we've had two different classes from UNM in the Land Arts program, which is part of art and ecology at UNM. So they've they've come out. One one class was an intro to art and ecology class, and they spent um, a few hours their whole class time. Um, with me doing nature observation. And then another class came out from land, like the actual land arts class. And they spent like four hours and um, Joe Strange, the open space biologist and I were able to team up on that and have a really awesome long conversation with those students. This coming Friday, I have the wrong date on here. Whoops. Um, next Friday, um, the 5th of April, a decent sized group of sustainability students are going to come out for the morning from 9.30 to 12.30. And this is, I think, the first service day that they have had this, this year. Um, so I'm giving these as examples because these are groups that have all said that they're going to be back. Um, and with Cottonwood Gulch, we really have that routine in place. Um, that's also true for River Exchange, which is fifth grade students. And um, we don't have our connection with the uh, outdoor kindergarten anymore. And the, their leadership changed. And unfortunately, they're the one group that we kind of have lost in the past few months. Um, coming up this Friday, um, if you all are interested, there's going to be another 
Learn to Bird Watch in the series that the Open Space is putting on. And so Joe Strange will be leading this and um, Joe's training up a number of other people in her Open Space division to be able to lead these programs. And so this is an awesome free opportunity with lots of gear and a chance to get to know more about the different birds that are at Candelaria. And maybe you can help understand what the associations are between particular birds and particular habitats, because this is something we're trying to pay more attention to as well. I'll just say too that Rocky Mountain Youth Corps has been coming out pretty much annually. Um, so does uh, Ancestral Lands, but they didn't come out this past year. Rocky Mountain Youth Corps did. And man, I was so lucky. I, the first morning, met their crew lead, and um, that was Naya Sandoval. And I asked her that day what was she was going to be doing when she finishes Rocky Mountain Youth Corps. And um, as soon as she was finished with leading that crew, she came and joined the Rio Grande Return crew. And um, that's been an awesome, awesome experience the last seven, eight months. All right, so I want to take a moment and just frame this that we've, this is a, a map of what things were planted to when, um, when we started implementing the resource management plan, started really with this transition out of commercial agriculture and into a new system. Um, so this was a hay farm, right? And um, I have to remind myself that being a hay farm means that the soils not only were really producing a lot of biomass, but um, because so much was in alfalfa, that means like four, five, six harvests per year, per season, all within about five months. And so the soil was really used to being driven on by heavy equipment at a fast speed. And so the soils were really compacted and tight. And um, the irrigation was very efficient because of that. With us getting equipment off of the fields and letting a lot of diversity come in, planting a lot of diversity and maybe irrigating not quite so often, the soils are really starting to soften and the soil life is doing its part and has more to eat and uh, work from. So we're seeing the irrigation patterns change. It takes longer because the soil can take up more water at a time, but we don't need to irrigate as often. Um, I think I did want to just point out and see whether there's a conversation to be had here later um, about how the resource management plan and what these um, crop fields would turn into was um, really based on the understanding at the time of what this area could could do in terms of crops. And we really thought of these as distinct separate fields instead of the whole area as a contiguous um, single parcel. So um, we are working on developing these fields into what the resource management plan defines for the first period of time, which is years zero through four in the resource management plan. So we're still in that early window. And a lot of what that early window includes is to uh, get, get fields into wildlife crops. So we've done a lot of experiments and those have generated really helpful knowledge, but also a larger appreciation for just how complex this place is. When you're looking at it from above like this, um, it seems quite simple you know, manage a whole field the same way. Um, but we're, the more time we spend there, the more understanding we have about like the complexity and the different textures that are really present there. Um, so you can see 
hear that, so one B, this field, um, um, one, so, so one A, two B, actually that's not labeled correctly, but uh, this is this field, this field, and this field all have made good progress toward the future native habitats that are suggested for them in the resource management plan. Okay, so we always turn back to this and see where are we with, with the resource management plan. So I look at this one. Um, so in terms of restoration, have we worked with community groups, including youth corps and students to plant hedgerows and remove invasive plants? Oh yes, always. Um, and we have progress with the with the wildlife viewing platforms, which in the plan were called blinds. Um, we have made so much progress toward an interpretive signage plan that Jeannie has been leading. Thankfully, we've had Jeannie leading this and um, improving our, our signage on the outside of the preserve. Um, fencing needs have been identified. Um, we had a break, a couple of break-ins this winter, and um, fence improvements, gate improvements are slated. Um, so then we have all of you, many of you have worked to generate these monthly walking tours um, that are offered through the friends group and that uh, next one is coming up this Friday, tomorrow, and Jeannie and Ruth are gonna be leading that, I think with Augusta. Um, we do have a good bit of citizen science happening, but could could certainly add more. And this is something that um, Terry and um, a few of us are talking about how exactly we wanna work on that. And if you're interested in getting involved with expanding citizen science at the preserve, please, let me know. So as we head into this fourth season, I feel like being involved in the conservation world always means we need to remember to conserve what we've already created. So can, don't lose what you've got. And so that means each year that we make progress, we have more to then care for and maintain. Um, we're working hard to improve our monitoring and evaluation systems. Um, there were a lot of suggestions for what could happen in terms of monitoring and evaluation in the resource management plan, but there was no real focal point for how we would do that. And so I think I have a priority along with um, some of our project partners to really determine how we're going to monitor and evaluate for the long run, something that is gonna work well over time. We have um, a, eight wildlife cameras, really high quality wildlife cameras that I think you got to hear some about from Joe a couple of months back. And um, Naya, who, so with Rio Grande Return um, takes care of those cameras. She checks them and downloads all of the images and then pulls all of the images that have any wildlife, identifies the wildlife, and then makes sure that the batteries stay charged and um, that the cameras work. And Joe makes sure that we get the right kind of cameras um, if there's any problems with the ones that we've got. So. Using those cameras, we're uh, wanting to develop a, migra a migration corridor plan. So an understanding of where, where the critters are going, what their access points are, what maybe some limitations are, and how we can ensure their safety. We're um, working to expand the nursery a little bit, which doesn't mean more territory, but um, make better use of the space that we have. And then coming up this year, we're going to be working on um, restoration design plans for 1C, in this north central portion, for 2B and 2C, 
right in the middle. And then we've already begun taking steps toward converting 2A and 3A into their habitats. Um, so those have remained in fairly decent alfalfa the past couple of years. And now they're finally starting, to, the alfalfa is starting to, to wane. And that's our opportunity to get in there before we have any weedy species competition. So Rio Grande Return also um, was awarded a, a small funding opportunity from the Environment Department, the Wetlands Program, to work with um, the City Open Space Division to develop a wetland action plan. So that's a, that's a document that allows for us to gather stakeholder and technical expertise and um, provide that all to the open space division so that they can use that to move forward with, with wetlands management and revitalization. And this is one of four sites, or one of five sites in that wetland action plan process. All right, so we have a new crop plan every year at this time of year. And um, for 2024, I thought I'd go through a, with a bit more detail. Um, I think it could be helpful for you all to be able to ask questions as we're going um, so that we don't, or they could maybe post them in the chat. And then I'll help you. you post them in the chat. Yeah. You You'll stop me, Katie. Yeah. Okay. Good? That sounds great. All right. So 1A is our front door, right? This is the main, this is the field that most people see. Um, it doesn't have the intense border of elms along it. Uh, for those of you who walk along the Duranas. Or if you haven't ever been to Candelaria, this is our front door. This is the, the gate um, that you would arrive to. And this field in the resource management plan is proposed for um, wildlife crops, but with an emphasis on pollinator habitat. And so uh, in the short video from Esha, people were rolling out paper and had a lot of straw. Well, that activity was happening in 1A. And um, that all happened last winter, winter of 22 going into 23. And so uh, we m heavily mulched a lot of that field. And then another portion of that field, we created a, um, a, a wetland habitat type thing that's not open water, but it's um, coyote willow, Goodings willow, and a lot of native sedges and grasses. So this is like an ephemeral wet soil unit. Um, that's doing super nicely. Um, I'm really happy with how things are going in 1A. We want to continue, like we by, by doing the sheet mulching, we really were able to set back a lot of the Johnson grass pressure, but um, so now it is a bit manageable with hand labor. So we're going to continue to manage the Johnson grass, but we're also going to start adding more species in there. So I'm hoping we will be able to um, add a number of really pollinator friendly shrubs. Um, Chamisa, three leaf sumac um, are some major ones, uh, New Mexico olive. And so those are going to start going in soon. And we'll do some seeding as well. We're not going to flood irrigate this whole field. We're just gonna deliver water to the mini moist soil unit where the coyote and Goodings willow are. Um, oh, we also installed a huge number of hedgerow plants um, along the south side of 1A. And those you all maybe have helped water and plant and they're doing very well. They're waking up right now. And that's going to be really nice when those grow into one another. All right, so 1B is 
um, is this field. And this was an early um, experiment too. This is where we talk about the basins. So we've carved eight basins on the east side of the field that are all planted with like 850 native habitat shrubs. And they're tied in with the irrigation water that gets delivered to those basins with small canals. And then on the west side, we have what we call our Chihuahuan Desert Basins. And those are planted out to about 250 native Chihuahuan Desert shrubs and grasses. And those have done just very well. In the middle is an area that has been seeded with early succession grassland species. So sand drop seed, alkali saccatone, um, and a few other native grasses. Um, that area, we're really trying to keep people from walking in and um, keep the disturbance down because there are lots of tiny grass seedlings that have emerged and are just waiting for the right time to get fully established. The conditions we've been getting lately are going to be really good for that. We, Any questions? we have a ton of questions for you. Should okay. we start a few of them? Okay. Is that all right? Okay. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, what about people are asking, what do you do if you see someone jumping into the fields from the viewing platform? I've never seen that happen. I haven't either. Um, I would suggest you call the city, um, right? Or um, county or I so we have a law, we have a we have a, a open space law enforcement person available. And we also have a park ranger um, connected with the, the Rio Grande Nature Center. So I have those numbers. Um, so far, like any issues where somebody's there and not supposed to be, we've been able to handle those on our own, except for uh, the person who stole our truck. Wasn't able to have a nice conversation with them. Well, you know what, maybe what we can do is have a section of our Friends of Candelaria Nature uh, Preserve website dedicated to kind of, you know, FAQ kind of thing that even cool. mentions this. And you and I can chat about what we'd want to put in there. Um, a question that came, are you using the fungus treatment that I've read about to remove elms? And when I say I, that's Augusta Farley. Um, I haven't yet. I guess I have two bags of them in my fridge and I would like to, but we don't have an integrated pest management plan quite yet. And um, we'll, we'll include that there as an option. So I want, I want to do that, Augusta. And I think that the odds are we will get to do it. But um, what she's talking about is um, you can, take inoculated wooden dowels um, that have been inoculated with certain fungi and drill a small hole in a living elm, tap the, the dowel plug in and it infects the, the elm tree so that they're not as likely to produce so many seeds. So they begin to die back, but they're still standing and helpful structure for habitat. Cool. Um, is there any plan for milkweed to attract monarch butter butterflies? Totally. We've been planting milkweed a lot. Um, all of the, the basins in 1B have milkweed um, because they get enough water for that. And we've got some in the 1A mini moist soil unit. Um, those are the places that have enough water to support those milkweeds so far. But anywhere else that we're going to go in with like the final thing um, that's going to have enough water will always include milkweed. That was all the questions that we have at the moment. So I guess you can continue on. Thank you so much. Oh, I had one more question also, which was along the lines of the milkweed. Are you, when you were talking about the migration plan that you're developing, are mm -hmm. you considering the migrating birds and their needs along the way, like our cranes or our hummingbirds? Um, yeah, this is a, you know, exactly. Since the wildlife cameras are especially good at capturing the 
the big kids, as Joe says, the big animals, um, the mammals, um, that's that's not meant to to leave other critters out. We need to be careful about creating structure that could inhibit the ability for cranes to to take off. Um, mm. And I think, you know, in, in all of this, we're talking about um, a landscape that's been really carved up. And so whatever we can do to m reduce that level of fragmentation. And so that means, you know, we got to provide the hopscotch opportunities for for creatures of all different scales and as you're planting you're considering like what comes of season when the cranes come through yeah i think it's been interesting seeing where the cranes hang out because you know people had always told me like cranes are scared of tall things they don't like to go into they like those clean fields they really prefer a clean alfalfa field. Well, I don't I don't think that's holding up. Like they're going into some of our wildest, tangliest, tallest areas and hanging out in there a lot because there's plenty for them to hunt for in there. Mm. So we're caught up on questions. Okay. Okay, so one C is this field, right? And this field, um, it was uh, under contract with a different organization for the first couple of seasons. And so last year we took, we took over one, it included one C and four A in our management uh, for the first time. And one C, uh, boy, it's, it's got some strange problems. Like it has very high soil in the middle of the field and then really mucky soil um, in this corner because all the irrigation turnouts are clustered right up next to each other instead of the them being spread out along the ditch. The irrigation gates are, are clustered all together. So they're there are just some issues, and um, this field also has a whole lot of bindweed, and so it's been something of a conundrum. We've talked through some um, some possibilities for what would work well for it, but we need to be really, I think, quite gentle with this field because of the bindweed and the history of really serious compaction there. So I, I'm going to be proposing a, a design plan to um, Ciudad and the city that would help, um, I think, address some of those issues and keep keep water in some areas, but not need to flood irrigate the entire area. Um, so that's, that's you know, a, a thing that will probably, if, if we have funding, we would be able to start working on this this year. I don't think it would be super expensive to implement, but what we're going to suggest, but everything takes a little funding. Um, and then 1D is here. And you can see these two fields have always kind of seemed similar. This is a large portion of the overall preserve, and they were managed the same by the previous Farmer. So these were all in really strong alfalfa when we started in 2021. And so we've in in not harvesting alfalfa, the alfalfa plants become weaker. And we've added a lot of, of plant diversity into the alfalfa. So there's a lot of millet and globe mallow and uh, just sand drop seed, there are tumbleweeds, but um, these two fields have different near-term futures. So 1D is supposed to start um, transitioning from wildlife crop into the blue grama grassland type um, sooner, um, whereas uh, this field 1E is supposed to stay in wildlife crop like almost to the end. Uh, I think till like year 15 or more. So um, 
what we'd like to do this year in 1D is is probably mo we're, we're monitoring for just how intense the kosher and tumbleweed pressure is. And if we do need to seed with other like more native species or even some wildlife crop agricultural seed, um, we'll do that so long as we have the irrigation to support that. If it's just native species that we're adding, then we don't need to support that with irrigation. Any questions? Augusta asks, what next to soil, what is the biggest problem that you're addressing? You're, you are addressing. Do you mean in 1C? I think overall, probably, right, Augusta? You can pipe up, pipe in if you want to unmute. Yeah, overall, as you're going through, because I, I understand each field, what you're kind of planning towards, but I was curious about the problem. I, soil I get, and then I don't know, well, get after that. A, I mean, soil is not a problem, but we have to be sensitive to the fact that we have like a historic floodplain here that there's a good deal of difference between the soil types of these different areas. And sometimes the soil, often the soil type changes pretty dramatically, like right in a field. So that, you know, managing that entire field to become one type of thing may not always make sense, um, even though that's what's been slated for us. Hmm. So you're basically saying that if I'm understanding you correctly, that because this is a historic floodplain slash historic agriculture and over the thousands of years that this has been flooded in agriculture land and floodplain over millennia, some areas are really sandy, some areas are really acidic, things aren't going to grow. Forcing the monoculture crop works with things like alfalfa but by and large, a natural habitat won't be so tidy. Right. Yeah, like I think if if we had looked at aerial imagery from 1935, which we have of this property, and we could have seen the patterns that were evident in the vegetation at that time, even though there was some farming for sure already happening here, um, that that might've informed the layout of the habitats in the resource management plan more. Um, but because the, the recent history of farming and each field being a distinct field, because that was so clear in our ability to read the landscape at that time, the, the, the nature of each field field being a type of thing has has like really come through in the resource management plan rather than the patterns of the soils types and the history of past floodplain and side channels of the Rio Grande and all of that. So I, I don't want soils to come off as like the problem. They're really like, these soils are amazing. They're, they're, ability to heal and to um yeah to take to take in to 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 not be these glued <laughs> together particles on on top that I first encountered there and now they're like breathing living soils that take in as much water as you offer them and um, and lighten up after irrigation and are able to, yeah, to like respire so that there's soil life can, can recover after a, a flood or after a heavy rain. I just didn't expect to see that so soon. You mean you didn't expect to see the healing aspect of the soil so soon? Yeah. Well, carry on. This is fascinating. Okay, so now, now we're into 1E. So um, 1E, I already spoke to a little bit. Um, 
this is uh this is our far northwest corner and for this year we'll potentially add in more annual high value wildlife crop species um the the alfalfa there like i said has waned over time and this this part of the preserve used to be like the real hot spot for the cranes and um i think that's part of why it was slated to stay wildlife crop for so long um but you know i think we need to keep planting some some annuals that are going to put on grain that are going to help support those cranes it's excellent you know habitat still for lots of critters um but and it's sort of a a really nicely protected area for them they get a lot of privacy back here um but i i want to make sure that we're I, i've been prioritizing keeping equipment out of the fields as much as possible um but i think we're going to probably want to plant uh, plant a few more species in this area to provide that extra resource to attract those migratory birds. Um, there are some patches of Johnson grass in this field and this field, and so we're going to be focused on on digging those out by hand and trying to you know, get those under control because especially when it's really wild back there, it's uh it can be a haven for Johnson grass as well. Um 2A is this little field right here. And so this field um has a pretty high clay content and has probably been farmed for a long time, like hundreds of years. Um, this was in pretty strong alfalfa. And because it has the shade of elms on, on both sides, that alfalfa has stayed really happy and, and having the clay soils has, it has stayed really healthy. Um, what I'm saying is also true about 3A. So these two fields um, have remained pretty strong alfalfa. And so we have just left them in alfalfa for the past three seasons. Um, however, the alfalfa is finally starting to show that it's it's weakening. And so the, the bare ground is opening up. The sun is hitting the soil more. Um, and so rather than wait for it to become a tumbleweed patch, we just um, irrigated it um, the past few days and are going to plant native grasses in here and in 3A. Um, and the idea is that we would like to get a mix of cool and warm season native grasses established. And if they're strong enough, then we'd like to cut and bale them when they're in seed and use that plant matter, that material for mulch, for soil building for any kind of um for for a as an inoculant right of of a bunch of biomass with native seed on it that we can use anywhere else around the property so wouldn't be leaving the property oh i want to let you know that in a couple of fields uh 1d and 1e currently are just broken into two areas each. They have a single border going down the middle um, with um, water conservation in mind and if, trying to be more efficient with the water that we do have and knowing that sometimes we're gonna have very low water available I want to put change this from being two sections each to being three sections, and that allows us to put all of the water that we've got into just a smaller area, and then we can more effectively irrigate the whole area by, by doing less at a time. So we're going to remove this border, 
and instead put two borders in. And all a border is, is a low, long feature of dirt that holds the water in that section. So for two, instead of having three gates turn out into an area, we'll have two gates turn out into an area. Does that make sense? You do have a couple more questions. Okay. Um, when seed, the no-till drill, want to explain yeah. that? The no-till drill. Okay, yes. And, and our no-till drills are able to um, cut. They have a really nice, sharp culture disc um, that is able to slice through any um like large vegetation and not not woody vegetation, but it cuts cuts a path for itself, drops the seed just behind there, and then tucks the soil back together. And it's able to plant on a landscape that has a lot of previous biomass um, so that you don't need to have a clean tilled seed bed to drill into. Very good description. Um, Steve Glass just wants you to know that he loves the way you talk about the soil as a partner and a friend that can heal. Aww. <laughs> I'm, I'd be so much more nervous if I could see all of you right now. I'm glad I can't. Um, so to, to B and to C are these cuties in the middle that have always been represented as really funnily green in the resource management plan, but um, are slated to become some of our driest habitat types. Um, they're going to be a royal margin type or sand sandbar habitat. So um, for these two fields that the irrigation source is right here. And um, there are long linear fields, as you can see, that um, slope toward some of our, well, basically th these areas we think would be really nice for more kind of trees cotton there's already volunteered cottonwood trees popping up in this area and that's when these fields have not been irrigated for years for three years um so in in this season we want to develop some design plans and get those approved for for these two fields um the soil is strange it's like a about 17, 18 inches of, of clay, and then it's just sand, sugar sand, um, going down really deep. So um, I think it'll be very cool to see how we could um, try to create sandbar type habitat in there. So these are different plants. This is going to be like our, our Datura um, more more dry land species than than a lot of what maybe you've seen in the in the plant nursery so far. So the baccarus will still do very well there, but um, we'll have more of our fun arroyo plants um, if we can get these constructed in the next year or two. There's a possibility that we could like create this in a way that we can create a flash pulse flow of irrigation water that goes through the system and helps support those plants that are used to interacting with water that way. Do you want to explain that a little bit? That, that arroyo plants are used to... No, I meant the flash pulse flow. Okay, sure. So when we're flood irrigating most fields, the idea is that you keep the ground really nice and level with a gentle slope away from the source of the water. And so if the source of the water in this field is here and 
then the, the field is sloped away from there. And we kind of let the water out in multiple places so that it can flow across the surface at the same rate. If we were to create um, a mock arroyo in a field like this, then we would point each of our turn our gates, our water sources toward the same place and it would need to be lower than the ground nearby. So we create a little bit of an arroyo, a channel, and then we would open the irrigation gates and send through water, but then cut it off. And instead of trying to surface flood the whole field, we would send water through that would immediately soak in and, and disappear um, but it would have a really strong recharging effect of that area. And so we would have adjacent dry land communities alongside this area that gets inundated with water. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, 2D is this huge area here that is 17 acres and, or sorry, 13 and a quarter. I guess I'm adding together another field. So um, this is actually three different sort there. I don't know why it's all one field. Maybe somebody can give me that history someday. I'd love to know it, but this is actually three different irrigation sources for this large area and um, we're growing wildlife crops in this whole area and it's been fun. We did conservation fallow this field for the first couple of years, but then at the end of 22, we planted rye, barley and wheat together um, in September and got to irrigate it once or twice and it, it germinated, it attracted huge numbers of Canada geese and cranes and ducks, and they nibbled it all down to a nub, but then it the barley just bounced back like crazy, or sorry, the rye did um, in 2023 in the spring, this time of year, and it grew up and it put on seeds and um, Tons of sunflowers grew in there with it as well. Some areas last year, we had just a whole lot of sand burr grass. And so we did um, a light disking of those areas with the worst sand burr grass so that it could not go to seed. Trying to head that off. Um, and now the barley that hadn't germinated in 2022 or 2023 has germinated across the entire field. So we have 13.26 acres of barley. And what we'll be doing is, is um, we just irrigated, irrigated this and it all grew by four inches in the next, you know, in the following day. And um, so that will go to seed like in June and we're going to continue monitoring for the sand burr grass and hopefully it won't be, hopefully it won't be there. Um, but if we have too much sand burr grass, that's going to probably be after the barley has gone to seed. And so at that point we would be able to, um, cultivate or till to knock back the, the, sand burr and then drill into a new warm season summer crop, a wildlife crop. Same story for 4D. I think that that's on the next one. No. 3A is this field. I already gave you the scoop on that one that's going to be planted to native grasses so that we can hopefully bale them eventually. Um, 
3b is already pretty well set up for this year. I'm very interested to see. This has been, you all, many of you helped hand broadcast seed and hand spread straw, which we crimped into place um, to hold the seeds and the soil against wind erosion. And I think this is working well. To a lot of people, it looks like a blank slate, but um, if you look closely in this field, you'll see lots of little germinated babies and uh, the weather that we're getting right now is gonna be really nice for them. 3C is our little bosquecito, we call it now. And we've been just spending bursts of time um, working on removing Johnson grass and elms in there. Rocky Mountain Youth Corps has done a lot to help remove elms in there. And uh, the native grasses and all are doing very nicely in here. I'd like to get some plugs, maybe not this season, but next season of, of different uh, wildflowers and, and get those set up in there so that we can have more forb diversity. There's just a very strong, um, a, a lot of grasses in here and cottonwoods that are sending out new sprouts. Should I stop for a question? I think we are caught, oh yeah, I think we're caught up on questions as far as I know, unless someone has a question and they wanna pipe up. Um, I'm, But I'm gonna pipe up with a question since you brought up hand planting wildflowers. I'm curious how many, if, if we're to expect wildflowers this summer and if maybe we shouldn't, I mean, it's been tempting to renegade plant a bunch of wildflowers in your fields <laughs> as I walk down the ditch, like broadcasting them as I walk down the ditch, just in terms of like blue flax and beautiful things like that. Don't do it. <laughs> do it or don't do it. Do it or totally don't do it. I okay. mean, yeah. Like I just saw Jacob and I, was it Jacob? It was maybe ja Simon and I just saw like um, some, some Lewis flax popping up in 1A from, from seed that we just put down only like in the fall and globe mallow are germinating and popping up from seed in that area. So um, do it, like scatter the seeds. That's, that's great. I think we should all put seeds in our pockets as we walk. We Claude asks, uh, 2B has sunflowers attracting gold finches. That's not gonna be cut, is it? 2D? 2B. 2B. 2B doesn't... I don't know of any sunflowers in there. But no, we're not going to... I mean, we're, we're like, we need to do a design plan for 2B. Um, Maybe Claude's talking about 4B. Because I was just going to get to those. Let us know, Claude. Okay. Um, so let's just close these last ones out. So 4A is, um, is, is technically this whole thing, but in fact, um, two and a half acres of it, uh, is not able to be irrigated. So because the surface water rights were transferred to help support the ponds, over here. So we're not going to irrigate the two and a half acres that are on the east side, right up against the wildlife blind, the viewing blind. But we did plant like 137 different, like 137 shrubs on either side of a sort of amoeba shaped berm that we built to a specific height and size, knowing that it might attract coyotes to den there. Um, they need often a certain amount of soil mass to, um, to be able to create a den. 
but we've um, planted a whole bunch of wildlife, uh, like habitat shrubs, native habitat shrubs in, in um, dense clusters of the same kind, because that's how they do it in the wild. And um, those were all planted in one day with um, fifth grade kids from River Exchange. And they were just amazing. It was two classes and their teachers and they got it all planted. I was very impressed. Um, the other half of 4A on the west side is irrigated. And like I said, this has just been transferred to our management in the past like year and a half. And this year it has a really intense uh, bindweed issue. And so this year we've seeded it to oats and daikon radishes. And they I irrigated on Wednesday, no, Tuesday. And yesterday everything was already germinated and up. So less than a day later, total germination. Um, so the oats help, um, keep the bindweed from growing and the daikon helps by growing deep and fast and creating a lot of biomass underground. So the, the daikon radish will, um, be left to rot in the soil and that will feed soil microbes and soil, all kinds of soil critters. Um, and the oats we will let go to produce wildlife crop seed. It'll fall to the ground and the birds can eat it. Claude's question is about 2D, which 2D. you mentioned is growing in barley that yeah. had not germinated, that if I'm understanding correctly, was planted really in the fall of 2022. Yes. That's insane. That's so great. Right. And um, so the barley will grow up through the existing last year's sunflowers. Um, if, if we do have like a major sand burr problem um, and there are sunflowers growing over that, then we would need to make the call probably a about whether we really want to propagate that much sand burr grass seed um, in order to keep the sunflowers. I think that we had a pretty special event last year that caused the sand burr seed to germinate. Basically, we had the cool, wet conditions of June and July, and we were able to, to irrigate that area, and we were irrigating it. And so the sandbur grass got all these, you know, primed for germination. And then we had the heat wave of July and August. And those extreme, extremely high temperatures are the kind of thing that the sandbur grass likes. So we might have that pattern again, and we are more likely to have a different pattern this year, but um I think that the sand burr was particularly bad last year because of those, because of the conditions we had. I hope that we're not faced with that. Two more sections, I think, right? Those two. Yeah. We've got 4B um, and really 4C and 4B are, are pretty much the same deal. So um these are the two fields that um, the first week that we got our contract, we got these seeded um, to TEF and millet, and we have not had equipment back in these fields since the beginning of June, 2021. So these have been growing first, the first year the millet was on top and totally ruled and then it made way for the teff to come or the the millet to come up through the teff in the second year and it did it again last year and so i've just irrigated these two fields um and we will see if the millet germinates as it has the past two years if it doesn't 
then it's time for us to replant these because um, there are like the, the teff and the millet have been very good at suppressing the Johnson grass that was already present in these fields. But, um, you know, we need to, we need to make sure that there is a, a good wildlife crop um, resource for our, our birds and other wildlife in these fields. If the millet doesn't come up, then we've got to plant something instead. That's the story with 4C and 4D is basically managed similarly to, to 2D, although the soils in this area are quite different. And um, there's a lot of native forb diversity in here. So I try to keep a really gentle approach with this one. But I have some ideas about what we would plant as wildlife crop if we if we have find that we need to. Okay, I think that's as far as I got. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you so much. I, I feel like we've all learned a lot from you and we've been watching the fields progress and seeing your work. I, one question I have, and I don't know if it's your decision, is do you do you have a sense? You were talking about having um, more visibility on that side that's by the clear ditch over on the west side. That those large, you know, thirteen acre tracks. Would that be a place that you'd put a wildlife platform? Is back there off that tiny little ditch? That tiny little path. Should we go back to the map? Maybe. I can, I think it was your, um, if you can imagine the very west side of the fields, is there going to be some sort of observation area on this, this border over here that's bordering the purple? Over here? So yeah. there is, there is a wildlife blind already constructed right here. Oh, okay. So this one got constructed last year and this one was constructed last year. And where where were the, it, that's it for the wildlife blinds, right? Well, the plan has that there will be another one on the south side or long veranda, but, oh, Ruth, go for it. Please, Ruth. You don't have to raise your hand, Ruth. You're such a good student, <laughs> professor. Says the student to her professor. <laughs> Ruth, can you unmute and ask your question? Uh oh. No. Maybe she didn't. This is Jeannie. I just want to speak briefly, unless yeah. Ruth. Can, um, there certainly was a plan for a wildlife blind on veranda there. And I don't, it, it's been, the scale of it has been reduced. I don't know if it's going to even be built or not. I have, haven't heard that from Colleen because there's been serious objection from the neighbors along that road for a prolonged period of time. So essentially we don't write, none of us that I know of, on the on the zoom meeting right now knows whether there will be one or not. Thank you very much, Jeannie. Sure. Cameron, I guess one question I would have for you that maybe we could leave, you know, leave it with since we're kind of come to the end of our time together is um, what is your plan? Like, would you would the thing you really need from us right now is patience and support on those days that you're offering, you know, opening up for public involvement. Is that about right? Does that about sum it up? I think that's true. I think that, I think that there's still a lot of room for misunderstanding about the purpose and the, the spirit of this project. 
And so I think that what you've all been doing in terms of the tours and other outreach materials is really important for us to continue to do. Um, I think, yeah, like consistent communication with the larger community and not being too focused on our own neighborhood um, and allowing for more conversation with the, the larger community about the, the intent and the goals and and the the possibilities and kind of like Esha caught me saying like I think that we're doing this for the future generations right and so like we need to keep them keyed in and and connected with this place so so yeah I mean I love it when when people show up to help and I think we have a lot of fun but um but it's really important to like help people understand what what this place is about. Mm. Are there any more questions from folks? You can just pipe up, unmute, ask. Ah. Thank, thank you. Marvelous. Uh, much appreciated. Um, Thank you so much, Cameron. It's been really great having you here with us. Um, I want to let everybody else know, uh, first of all, thank you and a round of applause for you. Thank you so much. Um, you did a wonderful job. I'm, I'm very excited to continue our series every single Thursday, the last Thursday of the month. Next month, I'm super psyched because our speaker is going to be John Jahadi. He is an, an educator, an indigenous educator. He's Laguna and Zia. And he's going to educate us about the history of this area, exactly where we're, we're talking about at the preserve and the history, the legacy of farming that's been there for thousands of years. And it's very exciting to have him come. And I'm, I hope you'll all join us for that. The month after that in June, in uh, May, I believe it's May, we're going to have um, Laura Pascas come and talk about how drought is impacting the Rio Grande Valley. We're also going to hear again, I know, thanks Cameron, I did that wonderful. We're also going to hear again from Joe Strange, the biologist that's working in the preserve. And you might recall, she only had time to do the mammals. So she's got to come back and do the birds. And that's next in uh, coming up in this summer. And I'm I'm super open to suggestions for other speakers that might be appropriate. So if you if you have somebody in mind, please reach out to me. I'm just Katie at stone.com, like my name. So I I invite you to reach out to me for that. And I've posted the there is a YouTube channel for Candelaria nature friends of candelaria nature preserve and um unfortunately if i'd have to go digging around for the link to put it in the chat I, 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 Jeannie, i put it in earlier oh great um, it's, it's in the chat uh, you might do one more time for folks who joined later um but please share that because it really explains the mission of what we're doing and also invites public participation which is part of our mission so with that uh Thank you all so much. Um, oh, access to the video. These videos are getting posted to YouTube, to that page. Um, so thank you so much for, for all of that. And I'm going to go ahead and, and stop recording here for... Um,